All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suena Sunny. I'm a student at North Shore University Hospital, LIU Post of Cardiovascular Perfusion. Today, I will be talking about the effects of RAP and adjunct blood conservation techniques on outcomes of cardiac patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass. The purpose of this study was to analyze the results of retrograde autologous prime and hemoconcentration on reducing RBC transfusions requirements in adult patients undergoing cabbage with cardiopulmonary bypass. Retrograde autologous priming and hemoconcentration, my hypothesis, sorry, retrograde autologous priming and hemoconcentration will significantly improve the outcomes of patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass by increasing the hematocrit level, thus reducing the need for transfusion requirements intraoperatively. The results, um, hold on one minute, sorry. I don't know why my slides are like jumping around. I'm gonna just start one more time, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. So retrograde autologous priming is done as an effort to reduce the effects of crystalloid prime in the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. The lower priming volumes has significant, significant reduction in blood hemodilution and therefore reduces transfusion requirements. Reduced priming volume has reduced platelet consumption and activation, therefore decreases ble bleeding postoperatively. Few studies have shown that excessive hemodilution has been known to cause perioperative stroke. As a result of that, um, sorry. As a result of increased embolic load as the blood flow to the cerebrum increases. Additionally, removing excess fluid will minimize accumulation of fluid in the post-op period. Another way of removing excess fluid during, during cardiopulmonary bypass is by using hemoconcentrators. Although fluid may be removed using a hemoconcentrator, it has few drawbacks. A study published by the Journal of Extracorporeal Technology showed that using a hemoconcentrator can remove many drugs based on how much percentage of a drug that is bound to plasma proteins. Anesthetic agents are highly protein bound and have low sieving, sieving coefficients. And because of this, it can, be con it can become concentrated after hemofiltration. If volume is removed through the ultrafiltrate without subsequent replacement, the drugs which are not removed with the plasma water will become concentrated in the remaining blood volume. Therefore, it is possible to have higher, possibly harmful concentration of certain drugs present following a period of hemofiltration. Examples of highly protein-bound anesthetic drugs are fentanyl, midazolone, and pan pancoronium. These drugs have low saving coefficients, therefore they are not filtered out. These are some variables that are predetermined to be high risk for transfusions during cardiopulmonary bypass. Patients over the age of 70, female, female gender, patients with low CRID and low BSA and longer pump times are all considered high risk factors for transfusion of blood on bypass. This is looking at a study published by Oxford Academy in February 2019 pertaining to retrograde autologous priming in thoracic aortic aneurysms. It shows the results of RAP versus non-RAP on hemoglobin levels at various times before and after cardiopulmonary bypass initiation. Looking at the pre-op and hemoglobin level taken every 30 minutes on cardiopulmonary bypass, it shows a higher hemoglobin for the RAP group versus the control group. Mean, mean pre-operative hemoglobin levels were 12.99 for the RAP group and 12.66 in the control group. 30 minutes after the initiation of bypass, a notable a greater decline of hemoglobin level was monitored in control in the control group with the hemoglobin level of 8.95 versus 10.55 in the RAP group. 
in this study, the RAP group, the, the, the priming fluid was reduced to a mean volume of 661.7 compared to 1,610 for the conventional. This is again looking at the same study comparing interoperative blood transfusion in the RAP group versus conventional bypass. The RAP, the RAP group showed lower transfusion rates interoperatively. 70% 70, 70 of patients in the control group received RPC transfusion versus 48% in the RAP group. The patient dem demographics for my study is shown. The study group consisted of mainly male patients about 60 years old undergoing elective um, cabbage surgery. The medical measurements were taken at various, various times before and after the procedure. Baseline gas was taken when the f patient first arrived in the OR, and after heparin was given, first gas, last gas, and the post-bypass gas. For the methods, the only inclusion criteria were patients undergoing cabbage procedures, so there was no reabs or valves. The transfusion trigger was a crit of 21% or less. The sample size was 40, 40, and the patients were divided into the following groups. Group A was the control where there is no RAP or hemoconcentrators were used. Group B was the RAP group. Group C was RAP and hemoconcentration. And the final group was just hemoconcentration. An average of 800 cc's of prime was removed for the RAP group. And for the hemoconcentration, approximately 500 ml of fluid was removed. For this study, I wanted to see if any of the blood conservation techniques was um, statistically better than the other. In order to do this, I had to compare each technique against the other in various combinations. Between the four techniques and the five variables, it came out to 30 different variations. These are the results of my statistical analysis. The analysis was done using an unpaired t-test. A p-value of less than 0.05 was considered significant. Of the 30 variations, and looking at only the blood gases um, on bypass and immediately off bypass, 50% 50 50 turned out to be significant. The highlighted numbers are the p-values that were significant. From this result, you can see the hematocrit was significantly better in the RAP group and using the combination of RAP and hemoconcentration. The, con the control group did not show any significance when compared to the other techniques applied. This is the mean hematocrit results of each category when applying each technique. The combination group had a higher crit post-op when compared to the RAP group. The post-op hematocrit was taken after the administration of protamine and before cell saver blood was given. This is the calculated blood volume for each study group. You can see RAP group had a higher estimated blood volume. It's important to know that a high blood volume doesn't indicate a high hematocrit. Usually, if a patient is severely dehydrated, the hematocrit will appear higher than if the patient were normal volemic. The RBCs per volume of fluid artificially rises in severely dehydrated patients. But if a patient is fluid, fluid overloaded, the hematocrit will be lower than their actual level. A lot of times, patients with high blood volume with a low hemoglobin is treated with transfusion instead of volume removal through ANH or RAP before the surgery. Here is a baseline hematocrit for each variable that was measured. As can be seen from the graph, the RAP group had the highest baseline hematocrit. Interestingly, the control group had the second highest baseline hematocrit. This is a combined result of the mean hem hematocrit percentage. The combination group had the lowest baseline. I found this interesting because one would assume that patients with low hematocrit and low blood volume would not tolerate certain blood conservation techniques. Yet in this particular study, that wasn't the case. The combination group with the low crit and the low blood volume was able to tolerate the wrap and remove the volume using a hemoconcentrator. This is an overall look at the t-test results of my study. It shows a hematocrit in each of the times that hematocrit was, re was recorded. The following few slides slight um, display graphs that are statistically significant. The control group versus all blood conservation technique showed significant, which was shown in the earlier slides. The first graph displayed is comparing the technique RAP versus 
RAP and hemoconcentration after the initiation of bypass. The, the RAP group showed a hematocrit of 26.7 versus 23.7 for the combination. The last gas on bypass for the same RAP versus the RAP hemoconcentration group shows the combination group having a higher hematocrit, 25.4% versus 27.2% respectively. You do notice a big change in the hematocrit for the combination group at the end of bypass rather than at the beginning of the case. Interesting to point out that the starting hematocrit for the combination group was much lower compared to the RAP group. Again, comparing the post-bypass gas for the same group shows a higher hematocrit for the combination group compared to just RAP. Mean hematocrit for RAP group is 24.7 versus 27 for, for the RAP hemoconcentration group. The next two slides is comparing the techniques of using hemoconcentration versus RAP and hemoconcentration. Hematocrit for the hemoconcentration group is 22.6 versus 27 for the RAP hemoconcentration group. Again, hemoconcentration versus RAP and hemoconcentration. Um, hemoconcentration group was 23.1 versus 27 for the combination group. The different groups analyzed were similar in all parameters of cardiopulmonary bypass. So reiterating, the study showed a higher hematocrit and reduced number of transfusion of packed red cells doing cardiopulmonary bypass when using RAP and combination group. The RAP and combine, combination group did not receive any blood products on bypass. Although the control group for this study did not receive blood on bypass, their hematocrit dropped close to the transfusion trigger point of 21%. The control group had the lowest hematocrit throughout the bypass run. Overall, RAP and combination groups had a significantly higher hematocrit versus control. Interestingly, the combination group had the lowest baseline hematocrit but showed higher crit towards the end of the case. Using just hemoconcentration did not show any significance. Although the excess fluid was removed throughout the entire procedure, the correction of hemodilution by just using a hemoconcentrator is slower and is, un is unable to increase the hematocrit right at the start of cardiopulmonary bypass. Nevertheless, the debate whether using a hemoconcentrator reduces transfusion requirement is still ongoing. The, tr the critiques for the study are, the same, are, the, are that the sample size was small, data was collected from a single center study for the RAP group, and there was no standardization for the amount of fluid removed. The volume removed the RAP has to be tailored on the individual patient characteristics. Small patients with lower estimated blood volume cannot tolerate RAP as well as someone with a higher estimated blood volume. And also did not record if um, autologous blood was removed before the case. The objective of this study was to focus attention on safe and simple methods to reduce RBC transfusion without any adverse effects on clinical outcomes. Adapting the RAP technique into the daily perfusion routine does not require sophisticated or technical modifications and is not related to increased peri or post or operative patient risk. Complications of transfusion and therefore higher cost uh, should be exploited in any way to reduce transfusion requirements. Future studies should examine the role retrograde autologous prime plays in transfusion of red blood cells which will require a larger sample size involving all age groups, procedures, and surgeries. For best results, the amount of RAP done, done should be based on individuals, hematocrit, and blood volume. Choosing a circuit relative to the patient's size will help reduce the priming volume and help, and help prevent hemodilution, especially if the patient is small. So despite the small sample size, my study did conclude that RAP and combination of um, combination group had a higher hematocrit compared to using no technique or just using a hemoconcentrator. At this time, I would like to thank my program director, Mr. Richard Chen, for being a great mentor. Also, I would like to thank Perfusion.com, Mr. Brian, Susan, Marco, and Ty for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Thank you.